Good morning. <laughs> I'll just focus over here and then talk to Tom and Irene <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> oh, God just gave me a simple message. It's not surprising. Most of the things that he gives me are pretty straightforward and practical. Um, but I think there's power in it if we can just get a hold of it. I know what there is for myself personally. God, I just thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your faithfulness to this church and to these people, and they belong to you, God. And only you have the words that we need to hear. Just pray that our eyes would be open to see and our ears open to hear and receive what you have to say to us, myself included. Thank you for your anointing, God, that breaks every yoke of bondage over every life. I thank you that you care about every detail. You don't leave us as orphans, but you call us your own. Thank you for this word, God, and we just honor you in Jesus' name. So, um, there is a book. You, you might have heard of it. You might have read it. Probably not, but there's a book that they sell at Walmart, I think, and it's called... Um, it's called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Has anybody ever seen that on the show? I think they have one called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love. And it's, the whole book is about not making mountains out of molehills, taking things in stride. And, you know, it's so easy for us to get wrapped up in things. My husband's probably like, why are you speaking on this? Because me, of all people, I like things a certain way. Sometimes I can get flustered when things aren't perfect, being a perfectionist, especially housework and things like that. <laughs> My kids are laughing. Um, the author of the book says, don't sweat the small stuff, number one, and number two, it's all small stuff. But I remember, like, some years ago, you know how you have these conversations with God, like, why is this or why is that? And I remember thinking, man, God, you know, I've been saved for a while, and I've seen a lot of Christians that really love you. They really seriously do, but I only see a small percentage of people that are actually used by you in a great extent. And I'm like, why is that? I don't understand why that is. And I felt in that moment that it was because those people weren't able to get past the small stuff. They weren't ever able to get past the small stuff, and God wasn't able to use them. He wasn't able to fulfill his purpose in their life because they were caught up with the small things. How much time do we waste on our own lives, on our own desires, our own drama, offenses, trials, when we could be spending it for things that are eternal? You know, it's not that God doesn't care about what's happening in our lives, because he obviously does, or he wouldn't have numbered all the hairs on our head, right? He does care. He does care. But, you know, speaking to myself too, when is the last time we asked him what's on his heart? When's the last time we asked him what's on his heart? You know, it makes me think about the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. They weren't asking Jesus what was on his heart in that moment. I don't know, maybe they were tired from fishing. Maybe they were exhausted from all the ministry that they had done. I don't know what the case was, but they weren't asking Jesus what was on his heart. And you know, something big was about to happen, and they were going to miss out on it. What a bittersweet moment to be able to be with Jesus in the garden. What a bittersweet moment to be able to say, I was actually able to pray with the Savior I was actually able to pray with the Savior of the world before he went to the cross. But because they were distracted, because they were exhausted with the smaller things, they missed out on that moment. And it's so easy to miss out on things, but I don't want to miss out on what God's doing right now because I'm caught up with the lesser things that don't matter. The devil wants us to get caught up in our own issues, offenses, fears, and he wants us to become so self-focused so that we're not able to be kingdom-minded. Can anybody relate? I know I can. 
I know I can because in my job that was given to me by God, it's just an awesome God story. It was given to me by God, but I have to steward it well because in real estate, they tell you from the beginning, if you want to be successful, you always have to be available. You always have to be available, no matter what. Well, I'm, I'm learning, you know what? If I'm not available to God, then why does it matter? None of it really matters at all if we're not available to God. We're just spinning our wheels, right? God blesses us with jobs, and money's not a bad thing. He uses it. It's okay to have money as long as money doesn't have us. As long as we can hold on to it lightly. And when he says, give it here or give it there, we can let go of it. He doesn't want money to have our hearts. Amen? In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a, an end time vision that he shares in this chapter. Daniel 7.25 says, He, meaning the devil, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and change times and laws. Now, just looking at the con commentary of this, you know, most likely this has to do with during the tribulation period. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, it says he's going to change things up. He's going to wear out the saints till they can't handle it any longer, and he's going to change the laws. Now, I don't know when that is, but I will say this, that this can apply to the season that we're in right now. How can I say that? Because it's so evident that the Antichrist spirit is already in the earth. Everything is anti-Christ. Pretty soon, Christians are going to be the bad guys if they're not already. If you don't accept this lifestyle or this, you're the bad guy. The Antichrist spirit is already alive and well. And you know what? He's already changing laws. <laughs> He's changing laws. Why do I know that? Because just to go on this trip, I had to go online and I had to look up all the states that we're going through and see what the laws are today. <laughs> Why do I have to do that? Because they're changing every day. I need to know what the law is for D.C. when we get there about being vaccinated, what their law is about wearing a face mask, what their law is about testing. Every state has a different law. And guess what? Since I looked it up and we booked our ticket, those things have changed already. He's changing the laws and he's wearing out the saints. He's not waiting until later and just boom. No, he's been in the business of wearing out the saints for many years, for a long time. Just ask Samson. Samson consecrated himself to God. If you know the story, he took the Nazarite vow. Samson said, I'm not going to cut my hair because I'm going to do it as a symbol of consecration unto you, Lord. I give you my whole life. He takes the Nazarite vow, and God sees his obedience. He sees his faithfulness, and he's able to use him in a great way. Samson defeats a whole army on his own just by using the jawbone of a donkey. It's a cool story. <laughs> he uses the jawbone of a donkey and defeats a whole army. People were amazed at the anointing that was on his life. Why? Because he was consecrated unto God. He fights a lion with his bare hands and he wins. But still, even though God used him in a mighty way and the anointing was just on him so strongly, the devil was still able to get in. He uses different doorways to get in, and he was able to get in through lust. He used Delilah. Delilah came to him, and he, Delilah just bothered him and nagged at him day after day and said, please tell me the secret of your power. Tell me the secret of your strength. Samson finally gives in, and he says, it's in my hair. This is a symbol of consecration. And once she finds out, she comes to him in his sleep and cuts it all off. And he loses his strength, he loses his anointing, and she takes him out. Why? Because he didn't realize that it was a gradual thing. You know, the devil doesn't just come in and lay a bomb most of the time. It's a gradual process. He gradually wears us down, and we don't, might not even notice it. You know, and we see it in church all the time. Over the years, we've seen people come in, and they get touched by God in awesome ways. You know, they're at the altar, and they're just weeping and crying. They get touched by God. They go home. They're on fire. They're reading their word, praying. 
But then as time passes, maybe they get a little bit distracted. Maybe their fire begins to simmer down just a little bit. Maybe the devil starts wearing them down with wrong thoughts about this person or that person. There's just chatter going on. Slowly it wears them down, and pretty soon we see the people not coming to this. Or, oh, I can't make it to that. I can't be here for this. And pretty soon they've made their way completely out the door. And then we see on social media that they're back in the world. Why? Because it's a gradual thing. He, he wears out the saints. That's his goal, to wear us out. Samson's strength and his anointing came from his consecration. His strength and his anointing came from his consecration. <clears throat> the reason people leave, the reason they fall out is because they're no longer consecrated to the Lord. They're more into the world. <laughs> right? <clears throat> but we don't have to be unaware of the enemy's tactics. We don't. You know, many times he, he lies to us and he says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But the Bible says... We aren't helpless because in James 4, 7, it says, Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How, I mean, it's a common verse. We've heard it again and again, but how often do we actually apply it? Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Too often we give in and agree instead of resisting so he will flee. We give in and agree instead of resisting so he will flee right? I've never been bullied in school before. Not really. I mean, in the fifth grade, there was a season of my life that I remember. And there was this girl, she singled me out for some reason. She didn't like me. But, you know, um, she, I would be at school and she would just say these things all the time. She would be like, you know, I'm going to beat you up. I don't know what you say in fifth grade but <laughs> I'm going to beat you up, whatever. And, I, you know, I just remember, like, man, I have to worry about it every time I go to school. And it wasn't middle school where you change classes. You're stuck in the same class all day long. So at that year in the fifth grade, I'm stuck in the same class with this girl who always is just on me. I'm like, why does she hate me so much? And she was a bad girl. She was always in trouble. I, I never got in trouble in school. I think in the fifth grade I had straight A's. So <laughs> I didn't know how to handle the situation. And, you know, she was always threatening to beat me up. And one day, we went with our class. I don't know if you guys did this in school, but you go with your whole class to the library. <laughs> we went with our whole class to the library. And I'm in the library, and this girl, she comes up, and she says, I'm going to beat you up, or whatever she said. And I don't know what just rose up in me in that time. Everything was quiet. I just pushed her as hard as I could up against the wall. <laughs> and I held her there. And thinking about it, I laugh at myself because I think I didn't know what to do next. I didn't know because I'm like a good girl. I've never been in a fight. But I just wanted to shut her up. And I pushed her up against the wall and I held her there. Well, then, you know, it's quiet in the library. Any kind of ruckus, people come. So somebody came and we stopped. And then I was like, my heart was pounding. <laughs> and I was like, I can't believe I just did that. I just pushed the girl against the wall. And so, um, we go back to class, and when we're in class, it just happens to be rainy outside. It's a rainy day recess. And what happens on rainy day recesses? You stay inside. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, it's a rainy day recess. My heart is pounding even harder. So we're in the class. All the whole class is in there. We're supposed to be drawing or whatever. The teacher leaves. She leaves for like 20 minutes. We're in there by ourselves. And I had already just pushed this girl up against the wall, and she's bad. Man. <laughs> and I'm like, man, what's going to happen? Sure enough, she goes to the front of the class, and she calls me out. I'm like a good girl. I've never been in trouble. Straight A's. She calls me out, and I'm like, man, what do I do? I don't know what happened to me or what took over me, but I went up to the front. And all I remember, everything else was just a black, I just blacked out. We fought. And then the, the next thing I remember, the next thing I remember is there's a huge pile of her hair on the floor. <laughs> and like, everybody in the class is like, oh, 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 Heather can fight. Heather can fight. <laughs> And they're like so amazed that this little good quiet girl like can fight. And I was like, what just happened? I was like, my heart was pounding. And somebody else in the class came up and she, they picked up the hair off the floor and they went like this. Heather can fight. Heather can fight. 
And I was like, oh, my gosh. I, and, so, <laughs> and I just, like, I was like, oh, man, I don't know what just happened. But the girl, I noticed, she went and sat back down in her seat, and she was just embarrassed. And I went and sat down in mine, and a few moments later, the teacher came back. And, and after that, you know what? I, she, never, um, she never bothered me again. She never bothered me again. And throughout the years, you know, you grow up with the same classmates. And throughout the years, it was like a running joke. There was always talk about, Heather can fight. Don't mess with her. Heather can fight. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and this girl, she didn't bother me ever again. And later on in high school, I think we became, you know, friends. And so, but my point is that if I hadn't have stood up for myself in that moment, I would have been so distracted I would have been so miserable. I would have been just distracted on her, what she says she's going to do. What is she going to do to me today? What am I going to have to listen to? And the devil is just the same way. He's always talking. I'm going to do this. You're going to get this. Oh, you're going to be sick. Oh, da-da-da. You don't have enough money. He's always talking. But if I hadn't have stood up to that girl in that moment, I would have been miserable for the rest of the school year. And you know what? I wouldn't have had time or focus to focus on the things that were most important. What are we focusing on this morning? The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What we refuse to confront has power over us. What we refuse to confront has power over us. There will always be battles going on. <laughs> Not just in elementary school, all over the place. If you don't believe me, turn on the news. Go on Facebook. Go visit your family. There will always be some kind of battles going on. But you know what? It's not always about resisting the devil and fleeing. Sometimes it's just about keeping our peace. It's just about being quiet, walking away, keep moving, keep moving. You know, I don't have to give my opinion. I don't have to give my opinion on political matters at work. I've learned that. I don't need to give my opinion on political matters. What is it going to change? I keep my peace. I don't need to comment on everything on Facebook. Right? Sometimes we wear ourselves out just fighting battles that we don't need to fight. We wear ourselves out fighting battles that don't belong to us. We have to know what battles belong to us. Jesus didn't waste his energy defending himself. He wasn't bothered by all the people that didn't like him. Amen? We can't control people. And all the married people said, amen. amen. We can't control people. How many years we wasted, how many years I wasted being offended at the wrong look or the questionable comment in marriage, right? But the Bible said is it's to our glory to, to not be offended. It's to our glory to overlook an offense. We have to choose to, we have to learn to choose our battles. Ask ourselves, is this something I need to be involved in? Is this something I'm called to? Is this relationship a God thing or is it draining me like the relationship with Delilah? We have enough things to be worried about other than other things that we're not called to, right? When we become affected and distracted by the lesser things, it's hard to press forward. When we become distracted and affected by the lesser things, it's hard for us to keep pressing forward. If any of you guys, young people, have ever played Mario Kart, does anybody know that, what Mario Kart? That was around when I was a kid, and it's still here. Anyway, when you're playing Mario Kart, the point is, is that you're racing some other people, you're on a go-kart, and it's a race. And the point is to win the race and get the prize, right? But just as you're speeding up, somebody's going to shoot a little shell in your way, <laughs> a little turtle shell. They're going to throw turtle shells at you to try to knock you off your feet. Just when you're picking up speed, somebody's going to throw out some banana peels, right, to slip you up. But if we get our attention focused on the banana peels, then we'll take our eyes off the prize and we'll never finish the race. If we keep focusing on the little speck in the other person's eye, we won't have the energy to remove the plank out of our own eye that God's dealing with us about. In Luke 10, Martha, she was consumed with many things. We know the story. She was consumed with many things. 
but we have to learn to live a prioritized life. I always remember Pastor Troy, a message he preached, and it was titled, Prioritizing Your Priorities. Prioritizing Your Priorities. What are you prioritizing this morning? The Bible says many things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Many things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. We can't always do things the same way we've always done them and expect a different result. You know, actually, they call that insanity. <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get a different result. Harkey, when he was here, he talked about cycles. How often do we get stuck in cycles in our church, in our marriage, in our prayer life? How do you break a cycle with change? This next season may require us to let go of some stuff. God might say, you know, I want you to quit doing this. I want you to drop that, and that's okay, because God still prunes our lives. I want him to prune mine. He still prunes off the dead branches that aren't producing life. He, he cuts down the things that are heavy, the, the branches that are heavy, so that fruit can grow and have more room to flourish. If we feel like we're doing all the things, if we're doing all the things but we're not having any influence, we're doing all the things and we're not having much impact, then maybe we should be still for a while. Maybe we should just be still for a while. Pastor Troy, awesome message on heavenly places. It doesn't say we're running with him in heavenly places. It says we're seated with him in heavenly places. Amen? If we want a far reach, then we need to have deep roots. If we want a far reach, then we need to have deep roots. Amen? Jesus said he only did what he saw his father doing. If we're seated with him, then we'll start to see like him. If we, know, we need to know what to do next or where to go next, then we need to take a seat so that we're able to, to see what he sees from his perspective. Because if he's seated in heavenly places, he's above all the, all the noise. He's above all the earthly chatter, right? If we're seated with him, then we can see like he sees. Can you imagine how small things really are, how small they really look from his perspective? When we say don't sweat the small stuff, he's really not sweating the small stuff because it looks really small compared to him. It's Satan that's always busy. It's Satan that's always busy. One day in Job, chapter 1, I don't know if we have that. In Job, chapter 1, um, I think it's verse 7, Satan comes to the Lord and he says, and God says to him, where have you come from? Satan answers and said, from roaming through the earth, going back and forth on it. He's always busy. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on earth. He's blameless, he's upright, he's a man who fears God and he shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Did you catch that? <laughs> he says, have you, does he not trust you for nothing? It says, haven't you not put a hedge of protection around him and his whole household? <laughs> He's basically telling God, I can't even get to him <laughs> because you've surrounded him. But back in verse 5, it says that Job gets up every morning and he offers burnt sacrifices to God for his children. It says he's thinking perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. If Job could just see from the perspective that God sees, if Job could just see that Satan is having a conversation with God and saying, man, I can't even get to him unless you remove the hedge. You know why it was removed? Because God allowed it. Because he wanted to prove what was in Job's heart. Other than that, Satan says, you know what? I can't even get to him. I can't even get to him. He got up every morning 
anyway because he wanted to offer burnt sacrifices to God. How exhausting is that? If I had to get up every morning, go out in my yard and make a fire to God to atone for my kids' sins. Of course we want to battle in the spirit for our kids. But guess what? If I have the perspective that God has, if I remember who I am and that he has us covered, literally, he has a hedge of protection around us, around our families. You know, we're marked. Satan himself could see that Job belonged to God because he was marked. We're marked for eternity. It's not just Satan who gets to mark people in the end. It's God's going to have a mark on his own. Just like in marriage, I'm set apart to just my husband. And because I'm set apart to my husband, I get to carry his name, right? The same thing goes for us when we're consecrated and we're set apart to only the Lord truly in our hearts, not by coming to church, but we said, God, we consecrate our lives to you. When we consecrate ourselves and we're set apart for the Lord, then his name is written on our hearts. It's written on our foreheads. And in his name comes peace, protection, provision. Amen? Amen. Then the devil's going to say, man, I can't even get to weenie. <laughs> I can't even get to Anne. I'm trying to, but I can't. How many times in my own life have I had illnesses that can't be explained? Because by the time I get to the doctor, they say, I don't know what's wrong with you. We can't find anything wrong. Why? I know why. Because the devil may try. He may try, but we always have a testimony to come out with because God takes care of his own. Amen? We can rest where we're seated with him. And you know what? You may say, well, well, you know, I've had sickness come in. I've had disease come in. Well, you know what happens is when we, we open our lives to fear, when we agree with what the devil's saying, that's when we open up the door for him to come in and cause chaos. When we walk in willful disobedience, when we say, I agree with that, I'm going to be fearful, that opens up the door. Isaiah 43.1 says, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name, and you are mine. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you that we belong to you. We thank you that your name is written on our foreheads, God. We thank you that you have us marked for all eternity. We may hear a lot of voices from the enemy, God, but you are faithful to your own. Thank you, God. Keep us consecrated unto you this morning. We can rest in where we're seated with him. If we're constantly getting held up by the smaller battles, you know, I felt like that was the point of this message this morning, because God has big things for us to do, whether we believe it or not, but if we get caught up with the smaller things, if we're constantly battling the small things and getting caught up, then maybe our sword is dull. Maybe our sword is actually dull. You know, when you kill an animal and you have a hard time getting it back out, it's because your, soul needs, your sword needs to be sharpened, right? I can, I can brag about all the word that I know, but until I actually apply it to my life, until I'm actually in that situation where I have to speak it out, where I actually have to walk it out, that's when the power comes. That's when his freedom is there. That's when there's victory in my life, Amen. Don't sweat the small stuff because everything is small stuff from his perspective. God, we thank you for your word this morning, Jesus. God, you know, it's like a mirage. Like in a cartoon where you see a mirage. The devil puts out many mirages. But if we could just see through your eyes, if we could just see our importance as a son and our daughter and how you already have us guarded, how you already have us protected, then we wouldn't have to run around in fear. We wouldn't have to be affected by gossip or slander. God, because you have our backs. I thank you, Lord, that you can be trusted. And I pray that we wouldn't focus on the smaller things, that we would let them float off our backs so that we can focus on the things that you have called us to. 
Focus on the things that you've called us to, God, that you would find us faithful in those things, that we wouldn't be distracted or wore out by things you haven't even called us to this morning. We thank you for your anointing, God, that it may it rest upon our lives. I pray that you would strengthen us for the days ahead. God, fill us with joy this morning. That's our strength. We honor you, Lord Jesus. Help us not to to walk away from you, God, to step away at all, Lord Jesus. Keep us on fire for you. We honor you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. What an awesome word and reminder. You know, what I, you know, from this morning's devotional to this word, I really, really feel strongly um, that the Lord is really looking for people to use. And I know I'm speaking to the choir because you guys are all being used in some form or fashion. But um, I think it's, I believe it's going to really increase with what's going on in the world and all the, you know, the Bible says in the last days there will be an increase of wickedness. But how many of you know when wickedness increases, so does God's power. Amen. And he's looking <clears throat> for people to flow through. Um, we'll end with this. I, I, I just want to read this scripture again. And it goes along with, you know, what the Lord's speaking through Heather. Because there's distractions that can come in our lives, disappointments. And the scripture I read earlier, 2 Timothy 2, 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor. You know, Heather was talking about being consecrated. It says, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master. Set apart. That's what sanctified means. Set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Then it goes on in verse 22. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And verse 23 says, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle, be able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And we'll end with this verse. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. So it's saying there are people that because they have not set themselves apart or allowed themselves to be uh, corrected and aligned with what God had for lives, they may, come, they may not come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, and they became taken captive by him to do his will. So the devil is looking for people to do his will through but God is also looking for people to do his will through can someone say amen and you know I really really want to emphasize this that God is looking for these looking for utensils I gotta ask Tom and Irene I have to ask Ruth I have to ask myself I have to ask you, you Jolly Charles you know, how does God want to use you? Is he using you? And the, the, the measure that he's using us is based upon how we cleanse ourselves from the latter. Amen? And for some, I know that they might be used elsewhere. They, you know, they may not allow, allow the Lord to cleanse them. Um, there's other, you know, places that will allow... Um, people to be used without being cleansed but i'm telling you, it's going to affect if 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 there was rote droppings all of this and we prepared a meal for the youth how many of you know a lot of you the youth would get sick amen and so during this time you know god's i believe in this hour not just in church throughout 
the world. He's looking for utensils. Oh, man, what is this one for? Yeah. You know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jerry, when was the last time you used this? When was the last time anybody used this? But it's useful. And there are many utensils in here that has never been used. There's a lot of people that have never been used the way it was supposed to be used. Amen. This is not to be used to flip eggs. This is a whipping thing or whatever. And everybody has a certain gift. And But God, is be, if we allow ourselves to be set apart, consecrated, and sanctified, God's going to come. That's all, that's all we got to do is allow ourselves to be set apart. God's going to come and he's going to grab this. Oh, this one is ready. And this one is ready. Amen. God's getting ready to do some amazing things in our lives. Position yourselves. Get ready and get prepared. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this word, Lord God. That when was the last time we asked, us, asked the Lord what was in his heart? And Lord God, all the small stuff, the little things, Lord God, that I may sweat, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that I might be reminded, Lord Jesus, there are bigger things in life than the little offenses that try to creep in into our lives, the distractions in our lives. Father, I know you're positioning each and every one of us, Lord God, to be used even in a greater way. And I ask, God, that you allow ourselves to hear from you and you alone, uh, not what you did in the last season or, or what we think you might be doing in this season, but God, help us to clearly hear from you <clears throat> what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, <clears throat> amen, amen. I got to share this one last thing. Last week, I got a call. This is why I really feel, Brother Allen, right? God is, gonna get, is getting ready to use us in a greater way. I got a call from the principal's office last week, and they <clears throat> offered me two jobs, full-time jobs, one to be the special education uh, teacher, and the other one was um, to do um, CTE, career training, and I was really drawn to that, and they said, we have a classroom for you, we got a $2,000 stove, a, a deep freezer, a refrigerator, we got all the lesson plans, and we got this Hawaiian guy, we'll bring in fish for you, and this, and you just teach the kids how to cook, and I was drawn to that. Okay, you you be able to make more money. It'll be easy, and you just do this and this. And man, I was getting ready to say yes, and I felt like the Lord says, "Pull back right now." Just like exactly what Heather said, just sit down, just take a seat, and hear from me on this. And I felt like the Lord says, "Tell them now," <laughs> because we're approaching a season where I'm going to need more of your mind, more of your heart, more of your spirit, more of your time. And when I called the main office and you know the lady the secretary came on and said so what's the good news and i said jesus no i said i said what's the good news i said sorry i can't and i can't take the job and peace flooded my soul and in my heart there's this anticipation guys don't waste these next couple of weeks and months dive deep dig deep position yourself allow yourself to be cleansed consecrate stay focused and watch god do amazing things amen Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so at this time, uh, you know what, what, you know, for those, I know some of you guys got to go. I know you got to get to the airport. Um, but why don't we just go next door for those who want, can stay and we'll just have uh, some lunch and then uh, we'll just do some uh, light cleaning afterwards. I think we just want to get the youth room uh, uh, area a uh, little cleaned up and then um, the main sanctuary, some vacuuming and whatnot. So, Father, we thank you for this word, this time in your presence God, thank you, Lord God, uh, for warning us, Lord God, of what's to come and, and how we can prepare ourselves for what you're about to do. Lord, bless our food and our time of fellowship and be with those who will be traveling, including our family, Lord. Keep us safe. Bring us home safe and sound and healthy and even more prepared and more hungry and on fire to serve you in a greater capacity. God, we love you. We thank you for the faithfulness in each and every person in this place and online. We love you. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen, amen. Mm -hmm.